All right, thank you so much for joining us for this webinar today, Shaking Up the Breadbasket, The Dietitian's Guide to Increasing Biodiversity with Ancient Grains. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Old Ways, we're a nonprofit nutrition education organization whose mission is to inspire people to embrace the healthy and sustainable joys of the old ways of cooking and eating. Uh, you may be familiar with the whole grain stamp. Um, it's the gold and black packaging symbol that you see on whole grain foods. Uh, old ways is also best known for creating the Mediterranean diet pyramid in partnership with the Harvard School of Public Health, in addition to lots of other um, cultural diet resources and whole grain resources. So I just have a few housekeeping things to go over before I turn it over to our fantastic speakers. Yes, we are recording this session. We'll send you an email with both these slides and the video recording within a week. So I would say, if not tomorrow, then maybe early next week. Um, this is available for CPEU credit for registered dietitians. So um, attendees will get an email with the certificate as well when, they, uh, when we send out the email with the recording. And you can learn more about our upcoming webinars and view recordings of previous webinars on our website if you go to oldwayspt.org slash CPEU. Our next webinar uh, will be on March 3rd. Uh, the late, it will be called the latest in plant-based omega-3 ALA research and nutrition education approaches to meet generational needs. For this session, we would love to thank our sponsors, the Specialty Soy and Greens Alliance, um, for bringing you this lineup of fantastic speakers. And we will allow um, some time for question and answer at the end. So as you think of questions throughout this session, go ahead and type them into the chat box. Um, there's also, I see a Q&A function. So feel free um, to type in any questions you may have, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the session. So now I would like to introduce you to our speakers. Our first speaker is Shane Frederick. He's the manager of strategic programs for the Specialty Soya and Grains Alliance overseeing the U.S. Identity Preserved Assurance Plan and brand program and other projects, as well as communications. He has been in that position since November of 2021, after serving 18 months at the SSGA Communications Manager. Our next speaker will then be Dr. Lori Scanlon, who is Principal Scientist at Ardent Mills, the premier flour milling and ingredient company whose vision is to be the trusted partner in nurturing customers, consumers, and communities through innovative and nutritious grain-based solutions. Lori holds a doctorate in food science and human nutrition from Colorado State University and has worked in the food industry for over 25 years. She is the co-editor of Sustainable Protein Sources, um, which is a global book collaboration and is currently working on the second edition. She is also a contributing author of two best-selling quinoa recipe books and the Northern Crop Institute handbook called Ancient Grains and the, of the Great Plains. And then our finer, final speaker will be Dr. Neil Doty, who is the business development manager for the Northern Crops Institute. He has an extensive career providing guidance in building successful agriculturally oriented organizations, and his experience involves strategic business and marketing planning in cereal grain, oilseed, vegetable, and fruit-based um, food and fiber products processing and distribution. Um, so as you can see, each of these experts kind of work along different aspects of the grain chain or this grain food system. Um, so uh, it'll be great to learn how we as dietitians can uh, collaborate with these partners to bring more biodiversity and ancient grains into our patients' diets. So with that, I will turn it over to our first speaker.
Okay, thank you, Kelly. I appreciate it. Um, just sharing my screen here. Hopefully, everybody can see that. Okay, um, very appreciative of this opportunity uh, from Old Ways and the Whole Grains Council, and appreciative to uh, Lori Scanlon of Arden Mills and Neil Doty of the Northern Crops Institute for joining us today. SSGA is very uh, proud and excited to be a, a sponsor of, of this event today. Uh, a little bit about the Specialty Soya and Grains Alliance. We're a fairly new association, a little over three years old. Uh, we're the national association of companies focused on the production, processing, and shipping of U.S. identity preserved field crops and their related products worldwide. Um, SSGA's mission is to provide resources that communicate the quality, diversity, and availability, availability of those products and support allied companies throughout the value chain, including uh, agronomy, data, finance, insurance, logistics, and transportation. You can find out more about us at soyagrainsalliance.org. Um, our processor members, and most of our members are, are processing uh, companies. Uh, they supply a wide range of specialty grains and ingredients for food uses. Um, there's, uh, as you can see in our name, there's uh, a, a lot of soybeans, but uh, specialty grains is a very uh, strong and growing part of our organization. And that includes colored and waxy corns, cereal grains, such as specialized wheat, durum, barley, rye, oats, buckwheat, sorghum, millet, and ancient grains and small grains. And we have um, some specific uh, areas on our website, as you can see there, uh, where you can learn more about those and, and some of the processors who, who deal with those. One of the uh, big uh, projects that we've uh, recently unveiled was this mark of Identity Preserved and a website, usidentitypreserved.org, where um, we developed this through funding from USDA FAS uh, Agricultural Promotion Grant, as well as state commodities associations. This was launched in December, 2021. And the first companies have begun the, the process of getting qualified for using this mark. And this is a, a mark that we hope uh, will become internationally recognized uh, for identity preserved field crops. Uh, and a little bit about identity preserved. Um, so what is identity preserved? Well, identity preserved grain it has identifiable characteristics that are maintained through every step of production and transportation to the end user based on a specific written or verifiable IP system or plan. IP grains and oil seeds are segregated and can be defined by variety, type, modification, region of origin or growing practice, assuring that the product meets the buyer's needs. And uh, we developed this brand mark and assurance protocol really with some assistance and guidance from uh, the whole grains council and based a little bit of off of what uh, they're doing with the whole grain stamp and we think this is going to represent uh, this idea of identity preserved where where a customer can order a specific variety that is grown to their specifications from the farm and uh, through the processing and transportation goes untouched until a man food fit manufacturer uses it in its, uh, in its production. IP, as it's often known, although we try to call it identity preserved because IP stands for so many other things, including internet protocol and uh, those, those sorts of things. Um, this offers protection of variety, of characteristic, sustainability, uh, intellectual property, another IP term. Um, this comes direct through the from the field or through a process achieved in refinement. Uh, U.S. Identity Preserve stands for quality and quality that's assured through the great care that's taken by U.S. processors, farmers, and others at every step of, of this process. Um, one thing that we did when we developed this, this plan was to really show that those who are using it uh, are following a, a, a real plan of assurance. Um, you can read more about this on the website if you're interested, but companies that join this agree to an eight-step assurance plan that ensures the integrity of their product from seed to end user. That includes a program audit, uh, a, a look at what the grower, the grower activities are on the farm, field inspection during planting, source of the seed, uh, field verification during growing and harvest, 
crop segregation activities, which include on for farm storage until the processor needs uh, what they've ordered, uh, chain of custody of those products throughout and, and labeling and product information. And we are looking at a few different ways of marketing this, um, but what, one of the things that we think um, that we see throughout this process is really a, a feedback loop. And this is where I think uh, this applies to what we're talking about here today, is the opportunity for an end user, whether they're overseas, whether they're domestic, uh, to really provide the feedback for what they're looking for in the products that they order, in these, in, whether it's a certain variety or characteristic. Uh, the, the people who sell that product are listening to those customers and end users about what they want, and in turn, passing that on to the farmer who is able to grow specifically what they need. So they're hearing what the customers are saying. Uh, they're listening um, and they're finding ways to make sure that they can get those products to the end user. And as the consumer themselves become um, more, have, have, have a much louder voice or growing voice or important voice in this process, the more IP I think works uh, for them and for the whole process. So what we call uh, a couple of ways where we, we look at this, are the pillars of premium, uh, the idea that you can order with certainty that U.S. identity preserved oil seeds and grains are modern and trusted crops grown by great care from U.S. farmers and deliver specific varieties and traits that food manufacturers need for their products. They're verifiable, uh, traceable from their fields of origin throughout the process of production, processing, packaging, and distribution providing the knowledge and assurance that customers need, and seamless food safety. U.S. Identity Preserve companies have strict safety measures in place and safety protocols in place to ensure their quality. So this is what people are looking for, what customers are looking for and consumers are looking for. On the traceability front, we talk about fork to farm traceability. Everybody hears about farm to fork. We kind of like to go the other way and talk about uh, far farm to Everyone hears about fork to farm. We like to go the other way and say farm to fork. Um, it's because this traceability idea is really at the core of the process. That these are traceable through a documented, uh, through documentation throughout the value chain of distribution, packaging, processing, all the way back to the seeds for varieties carefully selected for a specific application. And we know there's more and more growing uh, consumer demand and retail demand for this kind of traceability. And uh, we believe this exists and that traceability in turn, you get that, uh, that feedback loop that is so important throughout the process. Um, we think this is more than a mark, it's a movement. Uh, there's a little bit different view of the uh, identity preserve mark uh, on the right there. Uh, it's uh, what we call our I IP allies mark. Uh, we're hoping that that will be, if you don't specifically deal in the food stuffs that uh, you can be part of this movement that you're a supporter of it. And we'd love to be able to see that mark uh, on, on the side of the road, you know, where, where you'd see so many farm signs, um, field signs. There's another example of it's already being used on some packaging. Uh, those are the first bags. Those are uh, identity preserved soybeans getting ready to be shipped. Um, so you're, it's, it's, it's out there. We're having our first companies signing up and using this, and we're really excited about that. So. Um, that's a little bit about uh, SSGA and um, the Identity Preserved brand. And I will uh, pass this over now to Lori Scanlon from Ardent Mills, uh, who um, has uh, another great presentation. So take it away, Lori. Thank you so much, Shane. That's exciting work you're doing. And thank you both um, Kelly and Shane for inviting me to present to you today. Share my screen. Hello, everyone. I'm Lori Scanlon, Principal Scientist with Ardent Mills. And I have the pleasure of working with different grains and pulses every day at Ardent Mills Innovation Center in Denver. I'm very pleased to speak with you about the role we have regarding increasing biodiversity with ancient grains.
Today I'll cover an introduction to biodiversity with ancient grains and discuss consumer trends and some application examples with a few ingredient spotlights and end with some actionable ideas for all of us. Biodiversity is important because it represents biological variety and variability of life on earth, which contributes to healthy environments, humans, animals, and economies, and ultimately sustainability. As it pertains to crops, the more variety you can have on a field, over time, the more varied the mix of organic matter will be. And if left, will naturally seep into the soil and boost organic matter content and nutrients in the soil. Promoting biodiversity with ancient grains may help to promote topsoil formation, increase crop strength, nutrition, and provide a premium to growers. Ancient grain production, especially in under, underutilized growing areas around the gro globe is a key to a sustainable future for crop production in feeding the growing population. The term ancient grain is often used by marketers and consumers to describe the minor cereal grains as opposed to the modern varieties of our top globally produced crops, which with, with a perception that they are, are less changed and even unchanged by breeding practices. For thousands of years, traditional breeding techniques have been used to adapt ancient grains to climatic and environmental changes. And as a result, they have changed over time. Currently, there is no scientific definition nor regulatory standard to define ancient grains. And we see differences different grains, seeds, and even pulses included around the globe in this, this um, term. Historically, they were consumed where they were originally grown and have gained popularity, especially in the US and Europe, due to perceived improved nutrition, unique flavor profiles, and or an emotional connection to the past. Though typically not part of American staple diets, Ancient and heirloom grains are rising in consumption and popularity, and they have rich histories with interesting stories of their origin, cultivation, and culture, which we explore in the NCI handbook for those that are history buffs like myself. The ancient wheats, such as einkorn, emmer, spelt, and corason, are the early ancestors of both the heirloom and modern wheat varieties. Heirloom wheat varieties are those grown pre-World War II or before the Green Revolution and were saved by individuals and continue to be cultivated. They have unique baking characteristics as more recently discovered by artisan bakers, myself included. And today's modern wheats are non-GMO but they have been extensively bred and the varieties that are commercially grown today have been reduced down to about 20. Heirloom wheats are much less than 1% of total wheat production. Yields on heirloom wheats are much lower than modern wheats. In some cases, more than half on dry land acres. This is why we see so many of the heirloom wheats grown organically, will it which will at least give the producer a premium for organic. In addition, ancient and heirloom wheats represent different species, which have great genetic diversity for important traits, including nutrition and adaptability to environment and climate change. This taxonomy chart shows both gluten containing and gluten free grains and seeds. True cereal grains are in the grass family shown on the left and below, and the gluten containing true cereal grains highlighted in dark orange, barley, rye, and wheat, all three have rich histories dating back thousands of years. Corn, wheat, and rice circled in red are the top three cereal grains produced globally in the, the billions and millions of metric tons. And although growing in popularity, the production of ancient grains 
is still minuscule in comparison and is typically measured in thousands of metric tons or less. Some of the gluten-free ancient grains highlighted in the pale yellow box, such as buckwheat, quinoa, amaranth, and chia, are also called pseudo cereals because they are not true cereal grains in the grass family. Buckwheat is a shrub, quinoa and amaranth are leafy vegetables, and chia is in the mint family. As such, they offer different seed structures, different nutrition, and di diverse genetics. Since the late 90s, the introduction of new foods with ancient grains and led by quinoa has increased from a half a percent to more than 3%, which is greater than a 500% growth. Ancient grains continue to grow in the marketplace during the COVID pandemic. And now more than ever, consumers are empowered to eat on their own terms and health and taste are at the top of the list. We studied a thousand general consumers recently and found the interest in ancient and heirloom wheat is high. 54% of consumers said they would purchase retail products that included ancient and heirloom wheat. The, this consumer also demonstrated purposeful or enlightened eating behavior that is concerned with where their food comes from, what's in it, and seeks labels such as those promoting organic, non-GMO, and plant-based foods, and likely identity preserved, as Shane mentioned. In the same study, we found that farro and spelt are recognized just after rye. Farro is an Italian phrase that includes einkorn, emmer, and spelt, which all differ, differ in their kernel size and are typically cooked as a whole grain wheat berry. I'd like to highlight a few ancient grains the first being einkorn. Einkorn is the most primitive form of wheat. It was first domesticated in about 10,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent region of Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. It's also called Pharaoh Piccolo due to its small size. Once nearly extinct, this trendy ancient wheat is experiencing a well-deserved resurgence among artisan bakers and other innovative food producers who cherish its history, nutrition, and modern culinary appeal, as noted by the Whole Grains Council. U.S. sales of einkorn reached 11.2 million in 2020. Spelt is also called Ferro Grande due to its larger wheat berry. The origins of spelt trace back to Europe or Asia, and it remains popular today, particularly in Germany, Austria, and Poland. Spelt is the most popular global grain in new bread products today. And 41% of consumers are interested in trying spelt or whole grain spelt berries. Spelt offers consumers an adventurous alternative to common wheat and satisfies a rising desire for organic, great tasting whole grain nutrition. I love baking with spelt in bread because it has a rich brown color and I feel a malty flavor and a European type of a denser crumb, which is wonderful. New food launches with ancient grains has experienced significant market growth, as I mentioned. Although they are still minor or niche in crop production. And one reason is because they may be promoted on the front of a label, but they may be used at a very low level in the product, which I feel is an opportunity for improvement. Ancient grains offer unique flavors and textures, whole grain nutrition, they're non-GMO, and many are gluten-free and um, fit nicely in the plant-based trend. Uses over the past two decades include bakery, snacks, beverages, pastas, 
and new applications we are exploring at um, the Innovation Center include understanding of the functional benefits, such as Maillard browning and, and utilizing that in a product, moist, moistness retention, viscosity, adhesion in batters, and even in carbon dioxide gas retention ability in gluten-free baking. Ancient grain and ancient grain flours are primarily used in their whole grain form and as such are typically higher in protein and fiber, especially than refined grains. This is also recognized by the consumer in association with ancient grains. Whole grain consumption is of course associated with decrease in cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, and improvement in digestive health and weight management. And recently in the scientific literature, researchers have identified an array of bioactive compounds in ancient grains that may have health benefits. While this research is um, still new and needs further refining, the studies suggest the bioactives could help in the areas of colon health, muscle synthesis, and immune modulation. This research is still ongoing, but looks very promising. Quinoa is a gluten-free pseudo cereal that has completely paved the way for consumer interest in ancient grain. Quinoa's explosive growth trajectory as the North American market has grown at a rate of 19.2% since 2010 per year, with a year-over-year -year growth rate of 17% expected through at least 2025. There are over 100 ecotypes of quinoa, which offers a high biodiversity value. And quinoa is now grown on every continent in over 25 countries from its origin in Bolivia and Peru. Quinoa is a resilient plant tolerant of drought and salinity stressors and can grow in harsh conditions where other crops may fail. Offering growers a profitable rotation crop that also supports water conservation, biodiversity, and soil health. Although still small scale in comparison to modern crop production, quinoa is a very good case study for the value in promoting ancient grains. I've been researching quinoa for over 20 years and am fortunate to have worked with growers in Bolivia, indigenous quinoa growers, and have seen the production increase about fourfold in the last couple decades. Quinoa needs less water compared to most crops, and in arid climates in particular with marginal soils provide insufficient precipitation for most commercial crops. The average amount of water needed per growing season per acre for quinoa is only 12 and a half inches. And this has favorable implication for agriculture water use. With the increasing po population in urban sprawl, farmers are challenged by crop irrigation and availability of arable land. With the inclusion of quinoa as a rotation crop, we are able to improve soil diversity and preserve water in an economically depressed, depressed area in Colorado. And for every thousand acres of quinoa planted, we have seen 366 million gallons of water saved, which is the equivalent of 550 Olympic sized swimming pools. At Ardent Mills, we are proud to partner with growers that are including ancient grains in their rotations in areas where majority of crops are wheat, potato, and alfalfa. As consumers are demanding more diversity in their diets, growers and other agricultural stakeholders are partnering to increase the accessibility and sustainability of these ancient grains. The agronomic performance of ancient grains is not as optimal as modern varieties, which can impact yield per acre and thus the sustainability value for the land used to grow them. And so the advancements in plant science and biology have produced better varieties of ancient grain species 
with better agronomics, disease resistance, and in theory, greater sustainability. The rise in global population and clean changing climate will aid in the demand for ancient grains and interest will bring many opportunities for growers and entrepreneurs to be creative and prosperous. Staples such as corn, rice, and wheat have continued to erode from their top 90% of grain consumption. And in the future, we may see their consumption dropping to 70 to 80%, making additional room for ancient grains. Some actionable ideas that we can um, utilized to make this happen include culinary exploration for our own use in our own kitchens or in our professional kitchens, recipe and product development, education, promotion, and R&D, research, um, clinical research, nutrition research, food science research, regulatory updates, especially in the areas of bioactives, which is um, not regulated by FDA, affordable processing for the small scale farmers to consider growing ancient grains in their rotations and um, continued advances in sustainable breeding programs. Thank you again for the invitation to present and now I will kick it over to Neil from the Northern Crop Institute. Well, thank you, Lori. That was very interesting. Um, and I will take it over from you. Here we are. And I will uh, continue on the same topics that Shane and Lori talked about. And these topics will be um, uh, explored a little bit further. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Northern Crops Institute. We feel that we're uh, real serial innovators. We work on a wide variety of crops uh, in our area. Our area uh, that we cover at the Northern Crops Institute are North and South Dakota, Minnesota, and Montana. This area is uh, truly the uh, largest area of specialty crops. We, we have approximately 25 different crops that this region excels in. Uh, so it's not just corn, soybeans, and wheat, but we also cover most of the um, ancient grains that uh, Lori and uh, Shane talked about, but also a lot of other interesting crops. At the uh, Northern Crops Institute, we do two things. Uh, we provide technical services to companies around the world that utilize our crops. And in, in other words, we're the product development arm of many, many companies. We also provide courses and training on how to utilize those crops. And, um, and our training is uh, in form of uh, in-person courses, online courses, hybrid courses, and all webinars and uh, publications. So our mission is to support our regional agriculture and value-added processing by conducting educational and technical programs that expand and maintain domestic and international markets for Northern grown crops. We have hosted over 150 different countries at our facility, uh, teaching them about our Northern grown crops. Here's one of the primary reasons why ancient grains are so important as uh, crops grown in our region. Our farmers are keenly interested in regeneration sustainability. What does that mean? It means those farming techniques that sequester carbon in the soil. So it's practices that remove carbon from the atmosphere and put it back in the soil. Ancient grains are uh, adept at doing that. Ancient grains are also uh, utilized or, or uh, produced using reduced tillage or no-till practices. They're used as cover crops so that uh, the crops are covered uh, from wind erosion and uh, moisture retention. They're also used in crop rotations to 
to uh, reduce the amount of disease and pests. We are also looking at perennial crops. There's a new crop called, uh, uh, there are uh, a number of new perennial crops that are grown on margin, marginal lands uh, that ordinarily would not produce a crop. Uh, Kernza is one of the new crops that's uh, being explored at this time. Also integrating livestock management on crops is, uh, is uh, gaining a lot of research. And also we, uh, these farmers are trying to incorporate uh, organic waste and compost on their farms as well. So here's some of the technical services that we do at Northern Crops Institute. So if we have a company that comes in and says, we've got a really good idea, but we don't know exactly how to uh, produce this product, we have a, a lot of equipment and expertise on helping that uh, company uh, or group develop that product. And the intellectual property from that experience is actually owned by the folks that come in. We do not take an intellectual property uh, position on that uh, information. We can do baked goods, wide variety, pan breads, tortillas, flatbreads, pizza crusts, and we've done uh, this with ancient grains as well. We've got some extrusion technology where we can make puff products, snack foods, breakfast cereals, plant-based textures pro protein, either in dry form or high moisture form. We can do a lot of soy products. We have a soy milk, tofu, and other soy products laboratory that evaluates non-GMO uh, food grade soy. Uh, a lot of the companies that work with SSGA that are involved in soy production, um, we do a lot of their testing for them. We also have an oil seed branch where we can extract oil out of oil seeds, refine it. We can use cold pressing techniques. We can also isolate the protein from those oil seeds and we can determine cooking quality of oil seeds. The Northern Crops Institute was originally started as a wheat-based uh, organization back in 1983. And back then, the backbone of the, of the organization was in the milling of wheat and producing uh, and baking and also producing pasta. In our pasta press, we can produce 52 different types of shapes. We can do dry and fresh pasta and we can do many types of, pa especially pasta. If you go into a supermarket and look at all of the interesting soup, uh, especially pastas in there, it's highly likely that those pastas were developed at Northern Crops Institute. We also have a, a wide range of milling equipment as well. So uh, something that Lori talked about, the food trends for 2022 and beyond. One of the fastest growing categories is plant-based foods. Um, just a little note here, uh, barley, which is considered an ancient grain, barley-based foods or foods growth is about 3.1% per annually which is about double what normal food growth is. Uh, plant-based foods and plant-based meat alternatives uh, are becoming very popular, as you all know. You can see Beyond Burger and uh, other uh, meat alternate companies have been making inroads into uh, fast food chains and restaurants and also on the uh, retail shelves. There's a number of new beverages that are coming out and people are very interested in alternatives to uh, traditional dairy products. Foods, uh, they're interested in foods with simple ingredients and clean labels. Uh, ancient grains, of course, are, are very popular. A uh, new company uh, or a company called Good Sense, which makes uh, snack, uh, snack products uh, for distribution around the United States, has just announced a new uh, line of ancient grain snacks. Uh, Intra, folks are interested in foods that prevent disease, especially with our pandemic uh, that we've recently experienced. We're in year three, and the pandemic has actually accelerated interest in all of these topics. And folks are in, uh, interested in improving uh, their gut health uh, for um, uh, preventing disease and also for uh, longevity. Uh, 
folks are interested in foods that improve the environment. Uh, they're reducing their sugar and their interest in healthy eating at home. So ancient grains as whole grains, as Lori mentioned, a lot of the ancient grains are actually uh, milled to produce whole grains. And at NCI here, we also have stone milling uh, capability to produce uh, old style stone mill uh, ancient grains. And they have the original uh, parts, brand German endosperm. A couple of these statistics here are, are somewhat interesting. 62% of millennials say a perfect dish would have to have whole grains. And more than half of a survey uh, by IFIC said that people are trying to eat whole grains. Nearly 80% of consumers perceive whole grains as healthful. And the, our friends at uh, Old Ways, Whole Grains Council, have uh, done a lot of research in this area. And they've stated that the whole grains increased 19, uh, uh, whole grains consumption increased 19 grams to 25.8 grams from 2007 to 2020. And what's remarkable is that the Whole Grains Council has now uh, has a stamp on over 13,000 food products worldwide. In the, the picture, you can see some nice uh, uh, ancient grain breads, uh, which, is, which is probably one of the most uh, utilized uh, uh, product, uh, product lines. One thing good about ancient grains is that you can use traditional processing and packaging. You can take an ancient grain, like on the left, from wheat Montana, this happens to be spelt. You can mill it, produce a flour. Uh, Purity Foods in Michigan has spelt flour. And you can blend those ingredients and then produce a pancake mix, which is uh, high in ancient grains. So some, home, some baked good trends that are taking place. The pandemic uh, allowed us to really experiment with home baking. A lot of folks are now engaged in home baking and they're not gonna turn back soon. Their interest in old world recipes using ancient grains like emmer, einkorn, spelt, corazon, and teff. People are interested in new flavors, textures, colors. They want a safe, fun, and adventure and to explore new things. And if those products have uh, additional functional and nutritional features, so much the better. Some of the interesting uh, new products that are being introduced are like pizza coin, uh, cones, the picture that you see on the, on the right, uh, where a cone is formed and you put pizza ingredients on the inside. Croissant waffles, which are croffles, uh, are uh, gaining popularity as well. And 72% of uh, US consumers enjoy products from our childhood as well, like waffles and pancakes and such. And the good thing about uh, ancient grains is that they're friendly to the microbiome, which is the basis of wellness. Ancient grains pasta. This is one of the, uh, I would say, easiest ways for uh, a commodity to enter the market. I'll tell you a quick story. Vitaspelt on the left, that box, uh, was introduced back in the 1970s, back when no one knew what spelt was. Uh, an acquaintance, Don Stinchcomb, started a new company called Purity Foods. He started uh, contracting growing spelt in Michigan, and he started producing this product. And he didn't, um, didn't really have much of a market, and I was working at uh, General Nutrition Corporation at the time. And we got together and we introduced the product in those retail stores, and then the product took off. The product's still on the market. It's an excellent product. Here you can see some other examples of, uh, of um, pasta made out of ancient grains. Uh, you have an einkorn, you've got a combination also of ancient grains from Ronzoni and Catelli. Ancient grain meal bowls are, are uh, very, very popular uh, where you can use a wide, almost an infinite combination of ancient grains in these bowls along with protein sources and vegetables. Uh, you can use brown rice, barley, millet, et cetera. They're easy to batch cook at home. You can make a big pot, use it uh, throughout the week. Restaurants are jumping on the bandwagon with this. 
And if you look in the in retail grocery, you can find a a, a number of these companies that are producing um, these meal bowls. And like I said, it's an infinite com combination of ingredients. You combine pulse and with uh, cereal grains, you get a complete protein. And um, along with uh, vegetables and whatnot, you can get a highly nutritious product uh, product into consumers. Ancient grain snacks are also gaining big momentum. 56% of surveyed consumers are snacking more since the start of the pandemic, which is understandable. And um, people want to snack now with the purpose. They want more nutrition. They want it to taste better. They'd like to have it as a social connection. And also when you're having a snack, if it can boost your energy, it gives you more inspiration. Here's some examples of uh, snacks that are uh, gaining uh, market share. Um, crackers, chips, and uh, sticks. New beverages. These pictures show uh, barley milk. The barley milk is actually made from uh, rejuvenated spent grain from a brewing industry. They, the Anheuser Busch started a new company and uh, they are taking the uh, protein out of that uh, barley, uh, which was originally a waste product and producing barley milk. And, um, but that's not to say that other um, ancient grains can be processed to produce milk like almond milk, the one that's got the most traction right now is an ancient grain known as oats. Oat milk is uh, rapidly gaining and will soon surpass almond milk as the most popular non-dairy beverage. Here you can see also roasted coffee substitutes made out of ancient grain. Just to uh, uh, do a little plug here, our uh, Kelly from um, Old Ways and Lori from Arden Mills are both authors in the Ancient Grains of the Great Plains Handbook. And that handbook is now available uh, for purchase at uh, our website at Northern Crops Institute. So it's got uh, a number of chapters, very interesting, covers the full breadth of ancient grains and their uses, and is a handy uh, compendium to anybody that wants to learn more about ancient grains. And with that, uh, I thank you for uh, listening to this uh, uh, short presentation. And I'm sure that all of us will be available uh, after this um, to answer any further questions you have. And now I'll turn it back to Kelly for the Q&A session. Thanks, Neil. Um, and thank you so much um, to our other speakers, Shane and Lori. Uh, this was fantastic. Uh, so I see that a lot of um, you all have been typing in some questions, so I think I will just dive in. Um, Shane, I'd like to start with you. Um, we got some questions about um, the identity preserved process and about GMOs. So can you share what identity preserved grains fall under the GMO classification? No, they're mostly a non-GMO. Uh, product. Most of our uh, our members are non GM uh, do non GMO, um, so it would fall under that. Perfect. Yeah, I think um, many uh, people are surprised um, to learn how few GMO uh, or how how few types of crops um, have been approved for use for GMO in the U.S. So, thank you so much, Lori. During your presentation, you talked about. Um, true cereal greens versus pseudo cereals. So could you share what you mean by cereal green or uh, what that term means? Sure, and um, this, this goes back to my background in cereal science and the, the classification of cereals are from the grass or graminacea family grasses. So true cereal grains are in the grass family, seeds of grasses. And that is why others that are not in, in the, that grouping, that taxonomy chart are called pseudo cereals because they're not grasses. They're seeds of um, shrubs or leafy vegetables or mint. 
and they're consumed as grains. So that's where, where they get that term. Thank you. Um, and while we have you on this topic, um, for those of us who aren't in the agricultural field, could you clarify like what you mean when you say groat or wheat berry? Um, some of us might be thinking of berries, you know. Sure. Um, so I use a, a bunch of different terms. Um, kernel, berries are, are um, interchangeable. Uh, they're the whole grain um, part of the, the crop that is consumed as a grain, but it's cooked in a whole berry, whole kernel, whole grain form, intact. Great, thanks. Yeah, just like a, a little kernel of rice, essentially, but mm, yep. the wheat version, yeah, great. Um, Neil, during your presentation, you spoke about the importance of environmental sustainability, as well as your expertise in developing meat alternatives. So we had a really interesting question about how does the production of plant-based meat alternatives contribute to the carbon footprint and are there ways to manage this? The um, folks that are involved in, in uh, plant-based meat alternatives uh, fall into two categories. One is, is that uh, some of the manufacturers do, don't make no claims at all. Other manufacturers have done the analysis of meat versus plant-based. And what they found is that the plant-based uh, meat alternatives use a lot less water. And that's, you know, water is becoming a very scarce commodity, fresh water on the planet. So that's one of the primary uh, things about that. The second thing is that the uh, plant-based um, ingredients that go into plant-based foods uh, have, um, I would say, less energy input with regard to, because most uh, meat uh, is, uh, you might say, fed animals. In other words, corn, soybeans, other crops like that are fed to animals. There's a big, long chain of growing the crops, feeding to the animals, going to the slaughterhouse, going through transportation. And when you add up all of that energy, the plant-based uh, cuts out a number of those steps and, and saves a lot of energy as well. So in other words, less carbon uh, produced to produce that particular product. So I'd say water and uh, reduction in carbon, uh, carbon dioxide are the two main things with differentiation between plant-based and, and meat type foods. Thank you so much. I think that was, that was really helpful uh, to think about the whole journey of the food and how that contributes to it. Um, Shane, we have some questions about IP, uh, maybe in more than one sense of the word. Um, so specifically, someone wants to know, does the IP process, um, the identity preserve process, amount to patenting the grain varieties? Um, if so, that seems like it might work against biodiversity, or how does that work? Well, I, I think we think there's it, the, there is some promotion of biodiversity there. I think IP can be used to help uh, you know, specify types and styles of grain specific to region and finding growers who are interested in growing within that IP process um, as, as needs develop and, and uh, as demand develops. Um, there's a lot of decommoditization trends happening and, and, and we think IP is an opportunity to help local growers find uh, different ways to uh, diversify their crops, uh, whether they want to go into non-GMO, organic or other processes. So I, I think IP fits, uh, fits into that, that area that way. So it's not that the product is necessarily patented, it's more tra the traceability of it. The, for, yeah, and I, I, you know, I can't, I will admit I'm not going to speak to the patents on, on, on that. I don't know where that's at on, on the seed front, but I, from, I believe from, uh, and maybe, maybe Neil could actually answer that question, but uh, I, I think that there is an opportunity to, you know, really specify areas of growing and areas of demand um, 
for what we're talking about today. No, that's correct. That um, the uh, in in our region, I, I would say there's a intense competition for for acreage. With the 25 crops, our farmers have more choice on what to grow than almost anywhere on the on the planet. So uh, what that means is that farmers are always looking for opportunity. Um, and they're also concerned about the preservation of their land. Uh, they want to preserve that land for multiple generations beyond them. So they will take into consideration uh, not only the profitability of the land, but also how, how will this improve my land over time? And rotation of crops is extremely important. Uh, the identity preservation of a crop is going to be uh, probably a key factor in them being able to market their product because there's there's wide swings in uh, the value of their of traditional crops. Whereas if you can get, uh, let's say customers of your identity preserved crops, you establish relationships rather than just being another commodity, you have a relationship with the with the person that bought your product and they have a relationship with their customers. So by establishing those relationships, you have a much more stable crop production system. Thank you. Thanks Neil, that was well said. Um, Lori, there was um, some interest in some of the slides you presented about um, the study that Ardent Mills did on consumers about, you know, if they're interested in ancient grains and what they're buying. Um, so do you know, like, um, in terms of the population that was surveyed, um, how representative it was, if it was urban or a higher income group or? Yeah, it was general consumers. So it was very broad. Okay, great. And uh, as a reminder to those of you who have asked, we will share the slides and the recording on our website within a week, and we'll send you the information within a week. Um, we did get a question about um, where to find ancient grain recipes. Um, so I will say that you can find them on our website, wholegrainscouncil.org. Uh, we have plenty of recipes, but I would like to open it up um, to the rest of you um, I'm sure Ardent may have uh, some resources for recipes as well as some of our other presenters. We do, and feel free to connect with me at laurie.scanlon at ardentmills.com and maybe Kelly and Neil, maybe this is a, a, a opportunity for an ancient grain recipe book. Ooh, yep. yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I would like to make a, another plug if I could. Um, and uh, Kelly and, and Lori and Shane know about this. Uh, on July 20th, we're planning on having an ancient grain conference in Minnesota and details follow some, uh, in the next couple of months. But there we'd like to have, of course, Lori and, and uh, Kelly um, really expand upon recipes. We're more product development. So if someone comes into a, with an idea and making a new, let's say, energy bar or something like that, we can do that. But, uh, and we're not, we don't do very much at home type recipes, but um, people are really interested in using these. They're, uh, they're buying bread machines, they're buying, you know, uh, mills, home, home mills. And uh, the recipes that you find on your folks' websites can be uh, used for that. And you can get on the internet and buy spelt, einkorn, all these interesting grains and, and make wonderful uh, recipes out of the, or products out of that. Great. And we had um, some questions about like research on sorghum and millet. And I know um, some of the entries in Neil's book touch on, you know, various types of ancient grains. Um, so that could be a place for information as well as our website, um, wholegrainscouncil.org. So we have more questions than we have time to get to. Um, but thank you all for your participation today and keep an eye out um, in your email inboxes within one week. So with that, goodbye and thank you for joining.
I thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks.